Hi, Sylvie. Siri. Carmel. Liz. Amanda. Pat. We also got Alex. Dale. Is that Phil Atkinson? Saskia. Uh, Anne Grant out in Spain. Deb. Patrick. Jeff Fairfield again. Natasha. Andrea. Frank. How are you hey, doing, Frank? Good to see you. Good, good to see you, David. Thanks. Linda Weatherly. To see the top of her head. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> oh. It's strange. Oh. oh. That wasn't me. Ken, good, out in the Netherlands. Yep, I think my, yeah, I've got Erie down there. Davo, there's two hearts there. Caroline De A. Yeah, I think we've got quite a full house tonight, which is great. And if I don't do a call out for all of you, it's because Zoom limits me to the number of people that I can actually see on my screen. So when we go over that number, then uh, I I can't um, I can't see everybody. Mabel and Anne. Okay, so. <clears throat> Welcome to, um, to session three. Just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, if you can make sure that you uh, keep your microphone on mute because the session is being recorded on a different machine uh, than the one I'm using to actually do the presentation. And I have that on speaker view, so it records in speaker view rather than gallery view. So if somebody's got their microphone um, not muted, and there's a noise in the background, then it will cut to you as the speaker. Um, and uh, the, the video recording will, lo will lose me. Um, again, the usual format, um, I'm gonna uh, talk about the, the content of the session um, for this evening, um, and then we'll do Q and A. Um, if you could actually um, put your question, not just that you've got a question, but actually put the question itself into the chat and then i'll hand over to uh, to sally running that part of the session and she'll she'll call you up um to ask your question so i won't i i, I won't be seeing the questions in the chat so um you know ask the question again un unmute your microphone ask the question and then i will um i will answer it and also make sure that i've answered your question um properly just wanted to cover something that we covered uh, last week, because I think it's a really important concept for what we're talking about with everyday magic. And um, uh, one of our group members, George, uh, actually asked the question in the group. And uh, I said I'd, I would um, uh, I would answer it again um, in the actual session. He doesn't watch the live sessions because he lives in Australia and it would be really, and he, he leaves to work early, so it'd be really late. So George, um, uh, thanks for the question. Welcome to the um, to the recording. And uh, George's question was about what I might call now um, the higher self state, or you might call it a YN, the Alma Kua state. So you know, last week I was talking about um, when we when we're doing everyday magic, acting as if we are a higher self. And so I just wanted to go through that game. So it's a really important um, concept for every, everything that we're doing. 
So the idea of the higher self is the higher self um, is sometimes called um, uh, the Aumakua, totally trustworthy guardian parental spirit in a wire. Pane is also the creator of the universe. So your higher self would be the creator of your universe. Um, and has evolved to a level of consciousness where um, the higher self is perfect. And, you know, the laws, if you like, of perception and projection still hold true. So as a higher self, being perfect, your perception of everything and everybody would be perfect. But there's a paradox here in that uh, you perceive everything and everybody to be perfect, and you might still then want to make changes and go from one state of perfect to a new state of perfect. Whereas I find that what a lot of people do is they go, okay, we need to change that. Need being an away from rather than want to change that being a towards because they perceive some event or some or a place that somebody's in in their life being wrong and we need to move it from wrong or broken to right and fixed now again a paradoxical thing is whilst you're perceiving someone to be wrong or broken in some way or shape or form or even needing healing notice that word again needing healing which is an away from as in you perceive something to be in need of healing as in wrong or broken what we do in our perception is we actually maintain and hold them into the wrong or broken state um, and what we're talking about is actually enabling people to go from where they are now to where they want to be. So this is a really important, important thing because if we haven't got this thing inside of us, um, then whatever we do with the skills that we're now starting to layer on here, uh, they're not going to work. Um, the person will appear in our perception to stay in the wrong or the broken state, no matter what we do. So that's a really important thing. Um, where they are now is perfectly and absolutely where they should be at this particular point in time. And then we can move them from this, what we call an NLP, this present state to the desired state. And that's what we're gonna to start to talk about um, this evening with directionalized language so let's just talk about uh, firstly the power of words i think we've all had an experience of the massively destructive power of somebody saying the wrong thing to the wrong person at the wrong time in the wrong way um but you know the universe seeks balance so if there's a destructive power in words there is also a transformative and healing power in words. Therefore, there is a massive transformative and healing power of saying the right thing to the right person in the right way at the right time. That's what we're going to start to talk about here this evening. You know, one of my mentors in Huna, John Kahimi Kawa, used to say, in the word there is death, and in the word there is life in the words carry manner and from an NLP point of view the reason for that is that um, you know if we were to quickly draw a version of uh, the NLP communications model and I think some of you have seen me draw this before and so you know why I'm an NLP professional and not a professional artist um, is that you know, we've got this information coming from the outside, what people can see, what they can hear, what they can feel, what they can smell, and what they can taste. 
And we know that this is that all that information is filtered by the person's unconscious mind before we create what we call in NLP our internal representations, which are the pictures, the sounds, the feelings, the smells, the tastes, and what we call in NLP our AD or internal dialogue inside. And our internal representations determine our state, how we're feeling at a particular point in time. Our state determines our behavior. And our behavior determines our results. And our state also is very intimately connected with our physiology. Which is another thing to get here, because when we're doing everyday magic, how do we know that what we're doing is working? Well, the person's not going to tell you it's working because they don't know you're doing anything. But what you'll do is you will see that it's working because their physiology will change, which means that you successfully change their state. Now, here's the thing with words. When you speak to someone, whether it be uh, over Zoom, whether it be one-on-one -on -one or one-on-many, uh, on the telephone, face-to-face, -face, even in an email, you cannot not change a person's internal representations because what the person has to do is to change their internal representation to make sense out of what you've just said in their model of the world. So, you know, we don't, we don't need to learn how to change other people's internal representations. We've been doing it ever since we learned to speak. What we might need to learn is how to change a person's internal representations with volition and with will. And that's why words have a huge power and why uh, they carry such manner or energy and why John Kikimi Kawa say, you know, in the word there is death and in the word there is life. So that's the first thing to get in this, this puzzle here. Then, with the, the way that this is wired up in a person's neurology, um, the human mind cannot represent a negative in consciousness. Because if I said to you, you know, a classic NLP, don't think of a blue tree, what are you thinking about? A blue tree, right? Because you've got to think about what you're not meant to think about to know you're not meant to be thinking about it. Think about that for a while. So the first thing really to get here is we want to create, use our words to create the internal representations we want rather than the internal representations that we don't. So on the surface, just to give you an example, um, um, there's, although it sounds on the surface totally the same, there is a big difference between saying to someone, don't feel sad and feel good or feel happy. It sounds on the surface, linguistically, that they're the same. But the internal representations don't feel bad creates an internal representation of the person feeling bad. Whereas, you know, feel happy or feel good creates an internal representation of feeling happy and good, which will have an impact on the person's state and start to have a change in their behavior. So, you know, the general rule in um, everyday magic is say it the way that you want it. You know, where are they now? Where do you want to take them to? And then talk about this in the positive rather than not this, if that makes sense. Yeah. Then intonation patterns. 
those of you who know about um, NLP, you know that words are only 7% of the communication. Tonality is 38%, and our physiology is 55% of the communication. This is why, um, at what, like last week, we talked about our own state, because our state will be will be communicating out to other people through our physiology and it will be that that has the biggest impact now you might think so why are we doing this whole thing on directionalized language when words are only seven percent of the meaning communication the uh, reason why we're talking about language so much and we'll talk about language more as we go along through the program is because of the impact that it has on, on people's internal representations. Then we've got tonality. So there are three tonalities that we're particularly interested in. Um, so if I put a W for a word and suddenly we say word, 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 where this is pitch, Word, word, word. That is interpreted by the person's unconscious mind as a question. Or at least questionable. If somebody were to do word, 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 that's interpreted by the unconscious mind as a statement. Whereas the one that we're really interested in for everyday magic is this one, which is word, word, word. We go down in pitch at the end of the sentence. That is interpreted by the unconscious mind as a command. Yeah. So for instance, what we can do then with this, with these intonation patterns, is we can say something to somebody that we structure as a question. Uh, it will be interpreted as a question by their conscious mind, but we can deliver it using the command tonality so that their unconscious mind takes it as a command. So for instance, we could go, um, I don't know if you can feel good now. So there we've used the don't again, but we put the we put what we want them to think about behind the don't. I don't know if, pause, you can feel good now, which is what we call in an LP hypnosis. Uh, we would call it a embedded command. Yeah, so although it's structured as a question, which relieves the resistance. Um, then the unconscious mind takes the embedded command bit with the shift in tonality. What we can also do, if you wanted to put even more behind it, you probably notice I did it then, was, you know, I don't know if you can feel good now. And I'm nodding to, again, suggest through my physiology that they can feel good now. And also, you know, if you wanted to do that in a, in a group situation, then what you can do from hypnosis with the intonation pattern is what's called analog marking. And so if there was a, if there was a group of people and I want to put that suggestion in for just one person, then what I can do is not make eye contact with the person that I want to um, give the command to, but then when I give them the command, I make eye contact with them and then immediately after the command, I break eye contact with them. So it looked like this, you know, I don't know if you can feel good now. Yeah, which 
is that how we use our physiology and our intonation whilst we're doing the particular patterns that we're going to be building up um, over the over the, the following weeks. So then we've got um, destructive words. These are words that we want to avoid. So particularly destructive words are words like but. Because what the word but does is it negates everything that, that goes before it. So, um, you know, so for instance, I were to say to somebody, um, I know you can do this, but, and then put something after it, it wipes out what I've said before. So it's, it's in a way, the word but is like um, um, disagreeing with yourself in a way, uh, but also communicating to the person that you didn't mean what you said before. It just wipes it out. Now, you know, there are um, posh versions of book. Um, however, I know you can do this. However, you've got somebody else coming, which is basically saying, I don't believe you can do this at all. Um, and also, Nevertheless, there's the same thing as but. So really, we'd want to wipe these out of our language uh, unless we deliberately wanted to create that particular effect. But again, you know, John Kahimi Kawa, um, in the word there is death, in the word there is life, if there are destructive words in the English language, or any language for that matter, then there must also be uh, empowering words. And we can use these empowering words to use our language to directionalize the person's internal representations, to di directionalize them from where they are now to where we want to take them. And again, little law in the, uh, NLP, and we can use these words to do this, is um, law of pace, 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 lead. So we pace them where they are now. We agree with them. And once we've agreed with them and they've got that, then there's a particular structure using two words, which are probably my two favorite words in the English language that we can use to pace the person from where they are now and begin to directionalize their internal representations, directionalize their thinking to where we want to take them to. And those two words are yet and because. Yeah, yet, a little yet, because it presupposes that it's just a matter of time. At some point in time, in the future, this is going to happen. It might not be happening now, and it's just a matter of time. Because um, is a powerful word, because as human beings, we work on plausibility 
not rationality. And, you know, I think it was uh, Robert Cialdini in his book Influence um, did an experiment on this uh, at uh, the university where he was uh, a professor. And, you know, it's in the old days where we didn't have printers on our desks or anything like that. There was the, um, the, the department photocopier. So the experiment they did was uh, they sent somebody in as a queue at the photocopy machine. The person went to the front of the queue and said, um, can, I, can I push into the front of the queue? I only have two copies to make. And the success rate of some of them being allowed into the front of the queue, I think if I remember rightly, was about 30%. Um, they then did it slightly, added, added just one word. And I push into the front of the queue because I only have two copies to make. And the success rate went up to over 80%. So because is a very, very powerful word because it creates a cause and effect. Certain thing here, X causes Y. And the thing also is important for us to, to realize is the cause and effect doesn't need to make sense, doesn't need to be logical, rational, or sensible, just plausible. And this enables us to start to uh, directionalize the person's thinking. So let me give you an example of how we can build these structures. So the other person, Hey, another person you wanted to work everyday magic with says, I can't X. And that's the problem. So then we can say, I know. You can't do X yet. And important linkage here, using and rather than but. And that's because And we tag something on the end there, um, which then we can, so because this has to happen, let's say, um, and then what you do is you provide the cause. I'm going to give you an example of it. You provide the cause to get the effect. So I was, um, when I first started learning NLP, uh, when I was doing my pre-study for my practitioner training, which was in 1993, uh, my, you know, our, our pre-study now is on our online platform, C21 NLP. But in 1993, you had to do your pre-study on cassettes. So I've been listening to the cassettes. And um, I, I got a part-time job as a lecturer at the University of Westminster's Department of Information Technology, um, helping to get the money so I could fly out to California and do the, uh, do the training. And um, I was lecturing in project management. And... Um, you know, I'm at the front of the room. I've got about 30 um, undergraduates in front of me. Uh, I'm teaching a certain element of project management. And um, one of the students said to me, uh, put, a, put her hand up and said, David, I'm just not getting this. So <clears throat> we can actually do a number of things here. We can actually say, um,
that's right here beforehand. What I did with this uh, this student, um, I said, "That's right. You're not getting this yet." And she and she nods because she's not. So I've agreed with her. I know you're not getting this yet. Opens up now the potential to begin to lead, and that's because I haven't covered the one thing that will have you totally get this now. She nods, which again, she, which means she's agreeing with me uh, and she's also accepted the suggestion, if you like, or she's accepted the cause and the suggestion of cause and effect. And I then said to her, would you like me to cover that now? And she said, oh, that would be great, thank you. And I just covered the next thing I was going to be covering anyway, which actually wasn't related to the thing that I'd covered before, which she said she wasn't getting. So I covered that. And then I went back to her to check, to test, to check. And I said, how's that? Have you got that now? She was like, totally got it now. Yeah, you were right. I just had to, I just had to, uh, to get the thing that you that you've just covered. Thanks very much. Everybody else in the room is looking completely puzzled because they're going, what? is she talking about? What David's just taught us didn't have anything to do with what she said she didn't get. Yeah, but the priest, the, the, what we might call presupposition or the suggestion wasn't for the rest of the class, it was for her, right? So this is a pattern that we can use to directionalize and use a lot of things we've talked about already. One is, you know, that's right, we're agreeing, I know you can't X yet. Um, and notice, um, and that's because um, I haven't covered the, the one thing that you need to totally get this now, if you use the thing we've just been talking about previously. And then I said, would you like me to cover that now? And she went, yes. Now, as soon as she said that, I know that I've started to redirectionalize her thinking, or all I've got to do now is to provide what I said would cause her to understand it. All I've got to do is create that, and she will create the effect of getting um, the thing that she wasn't previously understanding, okay? So, that's our start on uh, directionalizing uh, language um, to begin to uh, create the scenarios of what we're calling everyday magic. Now, I'm just going to check that my, yeah, I'm still there. So if, you, if you've got any questions about any of that, um, if you want to put that in the, in the chat, uh, I don't know if we've got any questions in there already. What I'm going to do is hand over to um, to Sally to manage the um, um, the, the Q and A. So, Al yeah, Alex has a question. Alex Harrow. Yeah. Hi, Alex. Hello, David. Thank you so much. That is absolutely phenomenal. I mean, just great. Thank you. Um, what I was going to ask was that came to my mind. I can't remember exactly the wording of my question, but it's something like, do all pro pronouns act the same way as but in your little scenario? Um, all, no, not all pronouns. Um, because there are, the, there are other pronouns other than other than but. Um, so not, not all of them would delete what, what precedes the pronoun. Right, okay. Yeah. I mean, it, it actually is another destructive word I could add to the list as well, um, which I've just, and it, it's, it's destructive in a different way. Um, Right. 
you know, try and look on the bright side. Well, you know, what does try presuppose? These words presuppose that what's just gone before it uh, is wrong, not true. Um, like when you hear somebody say, you know, oh, I totally agree with you, but uh, basically saying I don't agree with you at all. I'm just paying a lip service. Try presupposes that the person will try and fail. So, you know, try and look on the bright side. Okay, well, I'm trying, but it's not working. Yeah. Um, so uh, that would, I'd add that one to the list as well. To answer your question, Alex. Thank you. That's great. Brilliant. Thank you. Any others, Sally? No, no other questions at this point. Oh, wow. Is that oh, what I yeah, we do. Um, the sound is breaking up a bit on occasions. Apparently, okay. your sound is breaking up. Okay. Um, um, and Giselle is asking which word replaces try? Do. Yoda, you know, either do or do not. There is no try from Star Wars. Yeah. So, you know, do X rather than try X. Except, you know, sometimes, and if you watch some of my demos, um, like I, for those of you at the um, Mindset Makeover at the, at the weekend, either physically or online, when I did a demonstration of um, enabling somebody to let go of anger using timeline therapy, my final thing that I said to them was, Okay, go inside and try in vain to find that old feeling. Uh, one presupposing it's now an old feeling, but going inside and trying in vain to have that old feeling. That's where this then becomes a useful word. But the way that most people use try, uh, it's a destructive word. Any other questions, Sally? Tonya has a question. Hi, Tonya. Hi. Can you give an example of how you would use this empowering directional language if a client says, I can't because they, they've already given themselves a because? So let's say, for example, I can't work out because I have no time. Right. Um, so what I would, I mean, obviously this is, um, just the first bit in this. Um, and we're going to look in more detail at some of that um, later on. Let me see what, what session it is. Uh, I think it's the um, session six is where we talk about slight of mind. Um, um so you could you could say something like um the only reason why you believe you don't have enough time is because you haven't effectively learned haven't learned how to effectively work out to get big results in the least amount of time would you like to cover that now which again is redirectionalized that's one of the patterns we'll talk about uh, later on in the in the program, um, but you see what you could do is with this pattern here, you could go. Um, that's right, or I know you don't have the time to work out yet. And that's because we haven't looked at how to rework your daily schedule. Shall we have a look at that now? Yeah. So what you've done is you've paced the whole thing. I know you don't have 
time to work out. But also you've created the internal representation there of both having time and working out. Yeah, because we take out the don't or their mind takes out the don't. Um, that's right. I know you don't have the time to work out yet. And that's because and we tag something on the end, which we, we can then make work. We can actually make it happen. Yeah. Does that answer your question, Tony? Yes, excellent, thank you. Sally, any others? Andrea Lambert has a question. Andrea. I'm not gonna put my screen on because I'm in a darkened room, so you can't see anything anyway. Oh, um, okay. If that's okay. Uh, yeah, just, oh, I love I love delving into the meaning of language. And I really love your explanation on because, because I've been listening to learning about hypnosis for years, but there's little insights that you get every now and again. Do you know what I mean? Through, yeah. When someone does something in a slightly different way. So my question is um, the word makes, so it's still a cause and effect. Yes. But, if somebody uses that word, is it the same explanation as because, or is there some other presupposition that's connected to that that word, to the word makes? It's uh, it wouldn't necessarily um, fit in with this structure here, but if we are wanting to to create a presupposition of cause and effect. Then we've got, you know, because um, it would we'd also have X in the, the example that you mentioned, X makes Y. Mm. Um, if X, then Y create the same kind of things. Um, um, and again, you know, th but this, these things don't need to make sense. Um, you know, I, I've known people as an example who've got a cause and effect belief that if Paul McKenna were to make eye contact with them, they'd immediately go into a deep trance. Now, is that logical, rational, and sensible? Not really. Is it plausible? Yeah. And so, because they've got that cause and effect inside of them, I've seen them before going like, no, Paul, don't, don't look at me, don't look at me, no, no, don't. And it all makes eye contact with them and they go, well, and they're, they're straight out, you know, or mm. another presupposition that you can use. I do this sometimes when I'm doing demonstrations. Somebody comes up to the front of the room, sits in the chair next to me, and I say, oh no, you sat in the trance chair. And I wanted to talk to you before you go into a trance, which again is pre presupposed this cause and effect relationship between sitting in a chair and going into trance. Is that logical, rush and sensible? No. But if the person accepts the plausibility of it and they're now sat in the trance chair, they'll go into a trance. Because what we do is whatever cause and effects we have in what we might call our model of the world, we will make come true for ourselves in our experience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did I answer your question, Andrew? Uh, kind of. Um, oh dear, I've, I think what, my what, head's so stuffed full of what's questions. The, what's the not kind of bit that you haven't got yet? Well, like when you were explaining because, you kind mm -hmm. of, it was as if you'd broken it down. Whereas when I was listening, I mean, I've, I've, I've heard that, you know, the whole trance chair thing, the, um, what's his name? Oh, I can't remember now. Uh, but yeah, just, oh, I don't know. I don't, I'm not sure what I'm looking for, David, but it's just something about, she, it's that finger pointing thing, isn't it? That accusatory makes you make me and you don't even have to say the word sometimes it's it's the implication of it being there do you know what yeah. I mean so what what we're using it here so yes it can be you know oh 
um, uh, him looking at me in that way makes me angry, as an mm. example. Yeah. Um, so then the person, that person then looking at me in that way because of the makes will just trigger them to feel angry. Uh-huh. Uh, but what we're, that's in their language. What we're looking at is how do we use it in our language to redirectionalize um, um, their thinking. So again, you know, in, in uh, future weeks, one of the things that we could do is we could go, okay, so has anybody else ever looked at you in that way and it didn't make you angry? Yeah. So using yeah. the bare word back on them. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, the answer to that question is, you know, there's, 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 it, there will always be somebody else that looked at them in that way and it didn't make them feel angry. Yeah. Um, so what we're looking at here is rather than um, um, rather than using the cause and effects in their words, we use them in our words to direct, uh, redirect their thinking. We will later on in the program uh, look at how we can um, redirect some of their some of their other words um, okay. when we built up a little bit more um, structure. Brilliant. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's a pleasure. Thanks, Andrea. Thanks for the question. Uh, haven't got any other questions at this point. Okay. Well, great. So, um, thanks for um, um, for joining us this um, this week. Uh, any questions that come up? Um, you know, put them into the real world NLP and HUNA group, uh, which I know some of you have been doing. Um, also, you know, if you think this, this would be valuable for other people, then please invite them to, um, to join the group. Um, and um, we will be um, back here. I'll, I'll get the, um, the video edited probably tomorrow. Um, so that will be coming out uh, to you. So look out in your inboxes for, um, um, you know, this se session three. Um, then we gradually build up a page. So that page will have session one, session two, and session three on it. And we'll gradually build it up until it has all seven sessions on it. But I should be able to get that done um, sometime tomorrow. So look out in your inbox. But also, you know, if, if you don't see it, then make sure that you look in your junk or spam because sometimes our emails wind up in there. Okay. Useful session tonight. Great stuff. Thank you very much. Have a great evening or great day or great morning or you know, great sleep, depending whereabouts you are in the uh, in the in the world. And uh, we'll see you for session four, uh, same time next week. See you. <laughs>